to first start with Brian and ask the logical question, which is, do any of the valuations, which we know that there's some that are 10 billion, some that are billion, your valuation, do they make sense? Because you're not from this uh, cannabis industry, no, you're from consumer products. I am, yes. Actually, my first 25 years was with Procter & Gamble. I moved 12 times with P&G and across eight different countries. So I've worked in North America, Europe, Asia, Latin America. And it's quite a big jump coming to cannabis, but I had something in between. I was in the wine industry for three years, which actually is very similar. If you think about a large agricultural footprint, a manufacturing process, part art, part science, heavily government regulated and um, government controlled distribution. So it's kind of a stepping stone getting to cannabis. But if you think about valuation, I mean, you need to look at who's being disrupted here, and right, it's, it's not like dot-com at all. Dot-com, you're measuring eyeballs on computer screens. There was no revenue. Here, if you look at the cannabis companies, there's no revenue either. But if you look in the black market in Canada, Deloitte estimates it's currently about six and a half billion. With legalization, they estimate about eight billion. The U.S. is 10 times that. Europe has 20 right. times the population of Canada. It's a huge market that exists today. It's not like it's being developed. It's coming from the underground black market right. to the, the legal market. And who's going to be disrupted from the growth? It's going to be um, beverage alcohol, top three beverage alcohol companies. The market cap's about 750 billion Canadian. Right. If you look at the top three pharma companies, all the opioids and stuff that are going to be replaced, it's a trillion dollar um, top three companies. Tobacco, top three are about 450 billion. The top five cannabis companies under 30 billion, right? right? So they're just getting started over time. The the the, the revenue and EBITDA will catch up. I, I, it's a great point because I was looking canopy growth 10, Kronos 1.7, Tilray 11. Point, uh, a 1.5, Aurora 6.1. We'll talk about Aurora. Uh, and then Green Thumb 2.2, GW Pharma, which we could say no with 3.9. Uh, those add up to 31. So yeah, okay. that's how I feel. I think you have to look at this as a market cap to opportunity, total Absolutely. addressed market. And that's why I agree with you. And if you, uh, we were talking with, with Tim Seymour before, I mean, if you just decide uh, at the moment that you wanted to buy Canopy at 52, that may be not such a good idea when it merely trades down. But then you also know that Rob Sands, who is the most shrewd observer of this, of the uh, wine and spirits and beer industry, has made giant commitments. What do you think about the hard nosed Constellation Company, Rob Sands, making that canopy investment? I think it was a good investment. I mean, if, if you look, and I think you probably got it cheap if you think that long term vision, um, rather than, than worrying about being disrupted and how to defend, it's how do you jump in and be a part of it. So that's what he's doing. Rob's a very smart guy. And if you look at what he's accomplished on Corona and on all the other acquisitions he's made in the premium wine space, the company's done extremely well. It's, it's a smart bet. Interesting that the uh, wine and spirits part of the Northwest, he's ceded to the distributors. Uh, my daughter lives in Oregon. Uh, I see the transformation. The, the, and Deb gave a, an unbelievably good teaching where Deb spoke. Uh, Deb, and I'm just going to don't, uh, maybe it's gotten even more, but the percentage of decline in traditional spirits in states where uh, mer where cannabis has surfaced. You gave some statistics that I thought were breakthrough. That's absolutely true. And uh, of course, a lot of the audience knows that, that when you do have legalized recreational marijuana, that the alcohol sales do tend to drop as people make that replacement. And I think I I've think seen some studies in Colorado, like 15 to 17 percent. A little bit higher on beer, lower on wine, which is more of a table drink versus kind of sports events and, and occasions. But um, I know but that uh, there's a, a my, where my daughter lives is in south of Oregon, and they've, it was a Pinot Noir area, and it, it's a marijuana area. But they, the cash crop is so much that they've actually depressed the price. But you know what they don't have? What you have, which is natural and organic, which I think that is completely in sync with the zeitgeist right now. Yes. Yeah, I mean, or, organic, um, it really resonates with consumers. If you think about uh, Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods for $14 billion, we want to be the Whole Foods of cannabis. But Hill and Knowlton, um, they do a lot of studies in Canada. They did a study earlier this year and found that 57% uh, of medical patients would prefer organic and 43% of recreational consumers would prefer organic. Doesn't mean that percentage when they go to the shelf and they see the higher price, they're willing to pay for it. But even if you look at other kind of food categories, produce, if it ends up 20, 25% of the market, um, that's terrific. That's who we're going after. That premium consumer is looking for a more healthier lifestyle. And we want to be laser focused on that. We don't want to be everything to everyone. Right. So, I mean, there's only two certified organic producers in Canada today. Um, there's one in BC, a craft producer, 40,000 square feet. We'll have well over 1.2 million. So, I mean, it's completely 
different. We're the only producer of scale in organic in Canada. But I mean, again, Canada is 37 million people. Right. Our goal is to become the global dominant player in organic cannabis. Well, I think you can speak to a concept. Uh, I have a lot of consumer package good companies on Med Money, and we spend a lot of time talking about, like, for instance, ConAgra say, look, if you turn around the label and if they have too many, if there are too many ingredients, then the millennials know. This was something yeah. that, that uh, Chipotle is struggling with, obviously, with uh, Brian Nichols, who's, who's from Taco Bell, 88 ingredients versus uh, eight in a burrito. When I look, at the amount of pesticide in some of your yeah. rivals, it's actually far more, right, than you would get from traditional ag. It, it, it's, it's scary. Um, I mean, if you think about um, your tomatoes, your cucumbers, you're washing them or you're peeling them. For weed, people don't wash their weed before they smoke it. And if you take pesticides and you burn it, it can become toxic. I mean, if you Google, you'll find a bunch of different lawsuits in the US around this. And you see pictures online of people in hazmat suits and some of these right. black market um, grow ops. It's scary stuff. I mean, we don't use any um, synthetic fertilizers, any of those pesticides. And people get that. It's safe. I mean, even if you're extracting oil, you're concentrating the THC, which is the, the psychoactive cannabinoid or CBD. You're also concentrating pesticides. Now, it's possible right. to remove it in the process, but it's still better to start, not start with it from the start, right? Oh, well, talk about... So, consumers uh, get it. Right. I, I know the wine has a lot of... The, some of the wine growers are willing to use a lot more pesticides than people realize, and the ones that are natural and organic are actually far, uh, few and far between. How would you get the word out that you are the whole foods? Well, I think for wine, it's a little different, though, because in, in alcohol, I mean, the alcohol basically kills everything. Right. Anyway. See, <laughs> but, exactly. But, right, but, right. but for um, how we get the word out is going to vary market by market. So in Canada, it's a bit more challenging because you can't do advertising um, on TV or radio, print, even sponsorship. Right. So it's going to be much more word of mouth. But again, organic resonates and that word of mouth will, will spread well. Um, we've got great packaging, which is very much focused on, on being environmentally sustainable. So we're using glass uh, packaging, which I mean, more than 80% of glass gets recycled, but 70% of plastic doesn't. Um, wood, I mean, just beautiful kind of packaging, which, which resonates with our consumers who are looking for a more sustainable footprint, environmentally friendly. Even our, our building, we're LEED certified. Right. Um, so, so really focused on sustainability. 90% of the water gets collected and gets recycled. We're using high efficiency LED lighting, not the high pressure sodium mm -hmm. that many in the industry are using. So really focused from everything from how we're cultivating all the way through the end product to make sure we are sustainable, we're environmentally uh, friendly, and, and um, that's something our consumers, being more premium, who, right. who, who really consume more organic products, um, are looking for us to be. So we really want to make sure we are authentic. All right. Yeah. So uh, before uh, I came over, we had an uh, interview on Squawk on the Street with the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Mr. Azure. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I have to tell you, um, he, he's not a fan. Master's not a fan. I want to talk about this. Okay. I asked directly to ask her, I said, listen, uh, you care tremendously. He was talking about addiction. So you care tremendously about addiction. You care tremendously about opiates. The only real solution for the people in the mental health field is cannabis. What do you think? Uh, he wouldn't even touch it. What is the, why is there a taboo? And also, because I think we have to be skeptical, has the pharmaceutical industry tried to stop you? Oh, totally. There, there's been a lot of lobbying from pharmaceuticals to even like prisons in the U.S., which are private, right? I mean, they're losing, there's so many people being incarcerated for small cannabis crimes or marijuana crimes. Um, honestly, myself, if someone told me even two years ago that I'd be working in the cannabis industry, I, I wouldn't have believed them, right? Um, I, I've never been a consumer of, of the products. Um, but after that first Constellation investment in right. Canopy, working in the, at Andrew, uh, the Peller, the largest wine company in Canada, um, my phone started ringing off the hook from different licensed producers wanting to do a similar deal with Peller. Um, so I started doing my due diligence, developing the strategy. First, how do we defend against mm -hmm. cannabis, but mm -hmm. how do we participate? Um, and I learned a lot um, about the industry and, and the help it's bringing. In fact, the mission of the Green Organic Dutchman the mission statement is making life better. That's really what it's about. If you look at all of the health benefits around epilepsy, anxiety, um, pain reduction, um, there, there's so many um, benefits. And even on the, on the other side, if you think about um, versus beverage alcohol, if you can have a drink that has um, zero calories, that has um, no risk of hangover, that's easier right. on your system and your liver for consumption, all of a sudden you're making life better versus a, a, a beverage alcohol. I mean, right now, there's still a lot of biases. And I had the same biases a couple of years ago until I did my research and due diligence. 
Um, people think of that stoner culture, they think of, right. of kind of smoking, and smoking's been on decline in North America for decades, right? Um, as you start to get into other product forms that are, that are better, whether it's vaping, but even more edibles and beverages, we see beverages at the top in terms of um, the highest margin, the best kind of consumption format, although you don't see that in, in recreational markets in the U.S. yet, because the products aren't there. Well, um, well, well, let's talk about the, the still water products. For instance, talking about marijuana-infused coffee, marijuana-infused tea. Tea, obviously, the most popular drink on the planet. Great methods, right? Yeah, so, I mean, their product, um, they have a product called Ripple. They've taken, basically, THC or CBD distillate, um, and they've created something that's truly water-soluble. So unlike edibles that take, can take hours to get absorbed into your system, it takes even longer to get uh, out of your system. Um, with this product, you get an onset within kind of 20 minutes, an offset within a couple hours. It's looking more like alcohol. Um, and then it's easy to replace. And because it's water soluble, yeah, it, it gets into your system um, easier. Um, it's, a, it's a great product. So if you look at their teas, I mean, that's something, I mean, my mom or your gra grandmothers out there, I mean, would, would like to have before going to bed, right? Mm -hmm. It's not to get high, it's to help them sleep, help them to relax. Um, same for if you think about the other functional beverages like uh, vitamin waters, um, think of the Gatorades, the monster kind of drinks. I mean, there's a lot of functional beverages pre-workout, post-workout um, that, that aren't about getting high. So I mean, we're, there's a lot of focus on beverage alcohol, and that's a huge, huge market. But if you think about other CBD-infused drinks, it could be even much bigger. Um, and that's what we're going after. So we're going after the soccer moms, we're going after the grandmas. Um, we're not really trying to have those really high, high THC drinks. Um, to get stoned. That's not what we're aware about. I mean, when I, when I drink a glass of wine or a beer, I'm not doing it to get drunk. I'm doing it to, to, to get me a little buzz on wine, relax, enjoy the food, enjoy company, social settings. That's really what we're, we're after. When uh, yesterday there was an article in Politico caused all the stocks to go down. Uh, and that was after the close. And it was, a uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency will continue to apply longstanding U.S. federal laws and regulations that treat marijuana as a banned substance, obviously going after Canadians who want to bring the product down and sell it. Can you really stop the tide? I, I think over time, I mean, that, that is concerning, especially for Canadians crossing the border. Right. Um, I mean, for us, we're a TSX listed company, so we can only operate in, in jurisdictions where there's federal legality. So that's why we're in Canada, we're expanding in Europe now with our acquisition in Poland. Um, we're expanding in Latin America with our acquisition in Jamaica and, and trying to get to all those markets. We will not be doing business directly in the U.S. while it's not federally right. legal. I think over time, the U.S., I mean, with the Farm Bill, kind of legalized industrial hemp, if that gets passed, um, will be a start. But then over time, they'll, the government will realize they're missing out on a, a huge segment of, of tax revenue of um, just, I mean, legalizing, getting rid of the crime, everything else involved in the illicit market. Um, it'll come with time and they see kind of what's, what's being missed. I mean, Canada's in the lead right now. Um, that's actually part of the reason I came into this industry was a bit of patriotic pride, right? And never in my lifetime has Canada been ahead of the U.S. in terms of in, in any market, right? You've got the best entrepreneurs here, um, but they're handcuffed. They can't leave their state with the product, let alone the country. Um, so that's part of what brought me into this industry. It's just a, it, it's just a huge opportunity for value creation. Um, and that's, I mean, we've been, um, our team has been working with U.S. companies for the past couple of years, understanding which are the best selling products, who's got the best technologies, and taking them and helping them monetize it by licensing the rights to those technologies for Canada and international markets. We have exclusive right, rights to the Stillwater example right. you gave, or Evo Labs has a number one and three selling vape in Colorado. I mean, examples like that to unlock value for, for those great entrepreneurs and, and, and technologies that they created, um, then also for us on, on international markets. Um, so it's been a good partnership. That's how we've been able to, to leverage some of those, those great technologies in the U.S. Um, the other thing we're doing, we're creating a spin-off company, actually, very soon, where it'll be a separate um, management team and separate board. Um, our, whoever owns TGOT stock on the 28th of September will, will have the rights offering to participate in that company at the first kind of seed round of investing okay. at a 50 cents um, with a dollar 50 and half warrant which is kind of similar. If you look at the T-God story, we've been mm -hmm. a retail story. I mean, institutions don't know us at all. Um, but many of our, our, our retail investors started from the first rounds investing at 50 cents, and then it went right. to $1.15, $1.65. Our IPO was at $3.65, and we did a bought deal at $6.40. They've seen that progression. Right. This is allowing people who own T-God now to get in on that seed round to be able to then focus on the U.S., consolidate. So you've got a great company in Colorado, another one in California. How do you take that technology from there to there? there to there without moving product mm -hmm. across borders right. and really build up a, a national brand. Because um, at some point the U.S. will, will legalize. 
Now, let, let, so Deb was kind enough to mention our, uh, the street conference October 13th when bring Mr. Mr. Newlands and, and Mr. Linton together. It's four days before uh, repeal. How big is repeal going to be? Uh, for for Canada? Canada? Canadian repeal. I, don't, I think it's going to be slow. You it's, do? Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms well, is of, it going to be like Massachusetts where they can't get it together? No, I, I think every province has different rules around distribution. Um, and even what's going to be legalized on October 17th is basically only the dried flour, pre-rolls, and non-vapor oils. So you know, vaping is a big category. It won't be legal then. People yeah. do it a lot, so they get it, get it from the black market. No edibles, no beverages. All of that's coming within a year. So actually for us, it's, it's probably a good thing because we're not going to be ready if our, our facilities right. aren't ready in October. We'll be ready um, for the beginning of 2019 and we'll be ramping up. So we'll be ready for when the second wave comes. Um, but on top of that, if you look at the retail landscape by province, Alberta, I think they will eliminate the black market much faster. Right. There's going to be hundreds of different stores and easy accessibility. But Ontario, basically on October, you're going to have online ordering from the Ontario Cannabis Store, which is owned by the government. Right. And hasn't been as successful on the liquor if you look at the, their e-commerce site. Um, and only next April will they have private retail stores. So that's a long period. I mean, people will continue going to their current suppliers of, of black market weed or drinks or whatever else and buying it. So I think it's going to take a bit more time. Okay. But, but then I think people will realize and then the regulations will have to change. There's a lot of restrictions as well on, on advertising. So you can't do any television, right. print. Right. Um, it's only really digital social, and then even packaging has to be one color with, with small font and um, a lot of restrictions. I mean, if you look, I think, in, in Colorado, packaging regulations have changed 10 times. Right. The same is going to happen. And so for, for me, we need to make sure we stay agile and nimble right. and, and constantly changing. Because our biggest risk, frankly, is, is regulatory risk, right, in terms right. of the rules changing. But that's our biggest opportunity as well. Now, there was a, a town that, where literally other growers, I guess, non-cannabis uh, growers, it, it gave you a fight uh, in Hamilton. I'm yeah. trying to understand that dispute. No, so in, in Hamilton, um, you, you, they have a lot of illegal grow-ups, which have had issue with, with crime. They've had issues with um, just even um, scent and stuff for, from odor coming out of right. their facilities. I mean, it's nothing like ours. We're, we're, we're licensed by Health Canada, so we've got proper security around that facility. Um, mm -hmm. We've got, like, all, it, it's impossible to get in there. Um, we've got all of the air filters for, for odor. It, it's nothing at all like that. Um, so, I mean, Hamilton, we started there, and we, have, uh, we really want to create a lot of jobs there. And so we've got all our building permits now to continue building. We're still working on the zoning piece of it uh, for part of the facility that, that mm -hmm. isn't zoned for cannabis. Part is currently. Um, but our really bigger facility is in Quebec. Uh, we're building 1.1 million square feet. So, so the, the, the Hamilton piece is only about 6.5% of our okay. production. So it's quite small, but it's still important. We want to make sure we have that operation in Quebec, or in, in Ontario. Um, but Quebec has the lowest power rates in Canada by far, okay. um, as well as the size of the operation. Um, because it's a million square feet, there's a lot of robotics. Um, moving tables around from where the grow rooms are to where the people are for the harvest. So our people cost per gram is, is low and our power cost per gram is among the lowest. So we'll be among the lowest cost producers. And then if you combine that with organic, organic currently sells for about a 30% premium. Mm -hmm. I expect we'll have industry leading margins. Okay, now so. we do want to speak to valuation of your company because uh, I, and I'm going to say something and I do not mean to be uh, off-putting, which is that no sales, but more than 300 million in cash. So we should be able to value you in reasonable way on 2019, 2020 yep. sales. Yeah, so it, it's, it's hard when you're looking, when, when you don't have revenue, and yeah. frankly, no one has material revenue or, or EBITDA, right. no one has any, right. any EBITDA right now. Um, so and I'm not a stock analyst to talk about kind of the, the mm -hmm. specific company valuations, but I think when I, I do look at what people are talking about are things like funded capacity. Um, and we've been trading um, more kind of nine, 10 times funded capacity. Right. If you look at uh, the, the market average for the industry has been more like uh, 12 to 14. And if you look at the other big players, they've been 20 plus. Right. So from that perspective, um, it doesn't look like it, it's overvalued at all. And then again, like if you look at who's this disrupting, that's huge market kind of caps right. there. Now you're not going to see it next year or right. the following year. But within two years, we'll be at scale and, and, and we'll have all of the other products legal in Canada. But again, Canada is only 37 million people, right? right? So we're, we're focused very much on Europe, having a first mover advantage there, and Latin America. 
So I mean, in Europe, we, we bought a company, Hemp Poland. It's uh, operating in, in 13 countries, 700 doors. We're investing that business, take it to 7,000 doors, eventually 70,000. Because CBD really is not regulated in the same way. You don't need a medical market it's for hemp that. It's pole, so. Right. So but it's industrial hemp based. Right. And you can sell it in, in uh, health food stores, in vitamin stores, in um, drug stores, not just pharmacies. Uh, do you think uh, that Tilray has hurt the group? And I mention that because until, you know, Canopy was fine because you've got Rob Sands buying uh, Constellation, buying in two separate tranches, obviously taking the valuation up, but in retrospect, as you said, uh, very reasonable. Uh, Tilray, $11 billion, uh, with uh, consensus estimates of $155 million in 2019 versus Canopy, $267 million with uh, Constellation's backing. Does Tilray hurt the investment case for uh, cannabis? Well, I think it makes our, our investment case look that much more appealing, let me okay. put it that way. <laughs> I mean, our, our production, the Tilray, I don't think, discloses their, um, their funded capacity. But if you look at uh, some of the research reports from BMO and others, um, our funded capacity is double theirs. Um, now, they've, they've done something else nobody else has. I mean, they, they did their IPO in the U.S. and had and very much institutional focus. Um, our, our IPO was the biggest prior to Tilray, Tilray in Canada, but it was very much a retail play right and, and no one knows us well right? but this is important because it gets to where I, I'm thinking which is that I know you've been traveling and I know you've been meeting with institutional investors how you do just you, started right yeah. but but I think that your story is a compelling one uh, our institutions saying you know what uh, this is particularly because of Tilray but also because of canopy this is one I have to have or are they saying you know what I'm gonna wait till after repeal I think if you look at our trading volume since we started talking to institutions this past week You'll see people are, are paying attention. Right, I so mean, the volume of liquidity has been fantastic. No, I, I want to use, I always try to figure out what metrics are the right uh, metrics to talk on mad money, and we've had uh, many of the companies on. You, you are from Procter & Gamble. Uh, funding capacity is not a, a metric that you would use no. at Procter. No, because it's a well-established business right. been there for, for more than 100 years, right? Um, so, so there, I mean, eventually you need to get to, to normal kind of things around EBITDA multiples right. and, and, and total shareholder return. Um, th this industry is still in its, its bare infancy. Um, right. It's, it's going to take time. Um, I think things will, sh right now it's funded capacity seems to be the, the most um, meaningful norm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's even started things like measuring, okay, what's, how big is your vault? You know, right. All those kind of things is where, where the industry started, right? Um, now it's funded capacity, it'll, it'll shift to revenue, and then after that, you'll shift to EBITDA and cash flow. Well, I, to. I had Green Thumb on recently, a stock I like very much, and they're talking about refining capacity, how important that is, and a, a kind That's of a suit to scale. That's you think easy so? to scale. I think that's easy to scale. Um, but for me, it's gonna, in the end, it's going to be cash flow. And if you look at, at, at these kind of businesses, it should be very similar to other CPG. I mean, I expect within a couple of years, we'll, we'll have um, kind of 90 plus percent uh, cash flow conversion from net income, um, which is what you'll see in, in kind of established CPG kind of businesses. Uh, we'll be there as well. But I mean, we don't we're not planning on paying dividends anytime soon, right? Um, because we really, don't want I mean, the, you to. The, the, we want the world, growth. The world is out there. We need right. to be growing. This is our chance. All right. So let's talk about the the best markets. I mean, I go to your website and go to the websites, and it's it's always we always see medical, we see veterinary, which I think is very important. We obviously see recreational, uh, beverage. Can you talk about total adjustable market in each of those sizes? In, in terms of current, what or do future? you think? I mean, like medical, for instance, people say fifty billion. Uh, it's particularly, and then I want, I want, because you started out by talking about disruptor, yep. I want to know what's going to disrupt, sleep aids, what's going to, pain, okay. let's talk about those. So for, for, we always kind of talk about it as a pyramid, right? An upside down pyramid. Yeah, at, you got a good the chart. They've got fabulous deck, by the way. I, I of course, picked the color deck. I <laughs> printed it out, but it's a really good deck in terms of trying to understand the company. So, so there's a slide in, in, the, in that deck, which, which has an upside down pyramid, which is how we think about the, the consumer and yeah. the medical market, both. Um, at the bottom is really where the category is today. So it, right. it's in, in dried bud, it's in pre-rolled flour, and then it moves to oil. But as you, and, and that's across both medical and uh, recreational. Right. We think medical will be kind of 10 to 15% of the market, but it's important for us because that's actually direct to patient in Canada. So it's through e-commerce, you're getting the full retail margin, so that's our most profitable channel. But then as you go up, you've got things like pet health. So, I mean, if, if not, you're not trying to get your pets high, right? It's right. CBD oils um, that help older dogs to, to, with inflammation and, and, and with, with pain. Or even think about expensive racehorses, right? They're in the back of trailers moving across, a lot of anxiety helps with that. So it's not even pet health, think of it as animal health. 
Um, and then you move up into other kind of nutraceutical kind of categories to uh, edibles, and we see beverages at the top. Right. Just because of ease of consumption. I mean, if you go into dispensaries now in Colorado, everything is focused on, on high THC, more at that stoner culture. The right. beverages that are there aren't, don't taste great. They have opaque packaging because the stuff in it doesn't look very right. good. People take shots of it. That's not what we're going after. We're going after the, the more um, social user, not, not trying to get high. Um, and, but, I mean, if you think about it in, in Colorado, even in California, the biggest category today in edibles and in beverages is gummies. Right, but are you going to go out with your friends for a gummy? No, you're going to go out for a drink, right? So right. That, that's really where we see it heading, and that's why we put beverages at the top of that pyramid. How do we educate people? I know your cannabis, uh, sativa uh, versus indica, no THC, know that a 50% chocolate bar THC is something that will make you incoherent versus a 5%. How do we educate the consumer? Yeah, that's going to be the challenge, and that's where I think it's it's getting into more micro dosing, mm -hmm. um, and and then on the packaging, being clear, people are going to try a bunch of different things and see what works for them, and kind of self self regulate what makes sense because everyone's different in terms of body, how it gets absorbed, and people have been using it for a long time, have much higher tolerance, um, so there's not a simple answer, but I think over time, I mean, it's same for alcohol, right? I know how many beers I can drink. Right. And, and, and still be able to, to function well or be able to, to drive um, in terms of over a certain period. Um, you might be a little different there, right, for, for beer or wine or whatever right. else. It's going to be the same as that. It'll take time. So people who are in the, um, who use it today, who consume it today, they know what it is, new consumers, they'll learn their way through it. And that's why for us we want to try to get to a place where we're mimicking things they know with, they know about, like beverage, like right. a, a beer. So trying to right. mimic, okay, the same impact you drink uh, uh, one glass of this, it's similar to a glass of beer in terms of onset and offset. Now, when I look at the packaging, you've got three different, uh, uh, I guess you get, you know, three different consumer packages. They look very much like Procter & Gamble. I mean, is that because you want them to no, understand? I, that, but that's where we're going after, right? Okay. Um, you need to have beautiful packaging that people can understand, they can relate with. In the end, this is going to be a consumer-branded business. Um, it's all going to be about having products that people can rely on and trust, that right. they know it's going to be the same each and every time. You don't have that in the black market, right? right? I mean, because they haven't had the water-soluble technology, you get a cookie and all the THC might be in one corner. You share it with a friend. Some, one has one experience, one another, and um, they, they um, don't feel it. They have another one, another one, and have a bad experience in the end. Um, that, that's not where, where we want to be. We want to have consistency in our products and the technology. No matter where you're buying it, it's always going to be the same, have the same impact. You need that to gain the trust and loyalty of consumers. Otherwise, we'll move on to something else. And same for customer service, especially on the medical side. Um, having that, that relationship directly with patients is critical. And having customer service that, that, um, that they can rely on and um, can explain things better to them is, is going to be important. OK, of the, uh, when I, I spent a lot of time with uh, the predecessor CEO of Proctor, who did struggle, uh, they were working with variations of NyQuil, ZZZ, uh, all things that, frankly, are uh, little less powerful than clonopin. But the doctors will give you a couple of drugs, and they ultimately do lead up to clonopin, which is very addictive, of above 1.0. Uh, do you think you'll have a hard time convincing physicians, when there be repeal in this country, that the sleep aids, which are many of them which are addictive, are just the wrong choice versus your medical. Well, if, if you think about it, I mean, uh, marijuana or cannabis, um, it, it's, it's not uh, addictive. It, um, it has, I mean, even if you look from a, a poison, uh, all the opioid kind of crisis, there's hundreds of people dying every day. Right. By the not, way, the HHS guy was saying yeah. it's peaked, but we know that you can't, you know, it's peaked well, in several states, but it's still going we'll up in others. Yeah, but frankly, any deaths is too many, right? right? I mean. Uh, peaked or not, it, it's, it should be unacceptable. Um, there, there's not been a single case globally of anyone dying from marijuana overdose, right? When right. you talk overdose, dose, it's not even the same thing. It's usually people pass out 90%. Or right. There could be a little bit of paranoia or even vomiting in rare cases. But opioids, I mean, there's, there's deaths every day, hundreds. Um, even alcohol poisoning, right? right? I mean, is, is a serious, serious thing. So I think for doctors, right now, I mean, people don't understand it. There hasn't been, because it's been illegal, you haven't had the clinical studies. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence coming out of the black market, but there's not a lot of clinical work yet, but it's coming. Okay. Uh, two issues that people don't talk about, one positive, one negative. I'll start with the negative. Uh, my staff asked me, because I said, please give me some questions, because we're intensely involved in all of these stocks. Uh, driving while high, 
uh, on cannabis versus alcohol? What do you do? Well, first of all, I know that's been a real concern as it gets legalized in Canada. Um, what do you do? But it's already a six and a half billion dollar market today. People are doing it already. So okay. it's not a matter of this is something new, right? So I think you need to start with that. Um, what, what, so I think it's actually a good thing because now with the legalization, it's being talked about, debated, which it hadn't been before, right? right? So now, because it's being um, legalized, there is a new, new test coming out to test um, kind of bloodstream or saliva okay. or all those kind of things. There's a whole bunch of different products. And even the, some of the Canadian provinces have, have started bringing those in. How, efficacy, how efficacious they are, we'll see. Um, but I think that's a good thing because I, mean, I don't want people on the street um, driving while high nor driving while drunk. Right. Right? Um, and it's happening today because the market's already there. It's right. not new. So because it's being legalized, people are talking about it. People are coming up with solutions to, to measure it. And that's terrific. Right. That's terrific. That's a good thing. I mean, who wants to be, a con I mean, even for my children, whatever else, I don't want drunk drivers or, or high right. drivers out there. Now, uh, the good one is uh, not talked about nearly enough. Uh, but I do uh, work with some uh, law enforcement, and uh, most violent crimes are committed by family, husband, wife. Uh, there is far less incidence of, and a lot of it's drunk, far less instances of violent mm. crime with cannabis. Oh, that's interesting. I, I'm not familiar with oh, data no, in that this area. This is something but... that uh, when they legalize it here, you're going to hear a lot about, I believe, because huh. they could be, remember, that's yeah. really the violent crime that we haven't been able to reduce. And the law enforcement people I know who are very, you know, very reluctant to talk yeah, about yeah. it because of the attorney general do say that it's alcohol that is involved in most of those murders. It, it would be different. That doesn't if surprise were... me. I haven't done much. Uh, research, I haven't done any research on that, so I'm not sure, but, but that makes sense intuitively. Right. Now, uh, after repeal, I had this image that you could go up to a province and go to a bar. It sounds no. like that that's, no. well, we're going to have to t temper so, people's enthusiasm for the stocks the week before. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you will be able to go into stores and you can consume it. Um, actually, a lot of campgrounds, things like that, and provinces that have said you can do it there, and music concerts. Um, but not bars, restaurants, but that's a matter of time. Right. It's a matter of, of social acceptance, right? If you look at people who um, believe in, in, in legalizing recreational today is much higher than it was five years, ten years ago. Right. Same in the U.S., right? It just takes time. I mean, if you look at any kind of social issue, over time it changes. Even, I mean, if you look at, at people who believe in gay marriage today versus five years, ten right. years ago, it's evolved. Marijuana will be the exact same, right? It's just a matter of taking time. So once you have recreational legal, um, a year later, you'll have the edibles, the beverages. People start comparing to benefits versus alcohol, other things. And okay, if you can have a drink in a restaurant, why can't you have a, a TH drink as well? It'll, it'll come. Okay, so now, whether it comes in a year, two years, five years, I don't know, but I believe it will come. Uh, uh, Rob Sands from Constellation has talked to me endlessly about the big problem of banking in the country. And the mom and pops, as opposed to your supermarket, because it's all cash business, own it. When you go to Boulder, uh, you'd be surprised that it's all kind of little houses that sell it. And it's not way, you know, you, you, if you just breeze in and out, maybe you know the places, and they're all rated by Yelp. I mean, they're saying right. something that Yelp does that they should talk about, but that they won't. What is the status of cash versus credit in Canada? So Canada, because you have federal legalization, the banks are banking the space, and that makes it night and day versus the issues in the U.S. So we have absolutely no issues in terms of banking um, within Canada, using credit cards, using debit cards. Um, it's not, it doesn't have to be a cash business at all. Um, our, our, our issues are more um, in, with the U.S. when you need to place suppliers in U.S. dollars and the banks don't want to deal with the U.S. because of the lack of federal right. legalization. So there, Canadian credit unions have stepped in and helped. Um, that's worked. So we don't have the same kind of issues that, that U.S. cannabis companies are facing. I, I spoke with the CEO. Okay, I just went, spoke with the CEO of United Parcel earlier today, yeah. David Abney, and I said, what's the status of shipping? Because a lot of people want to know, like right. Blue Bo you know, that you go to the Blue Bo uh, Botanical site and you're afraid to ship, I mean, you, you temp is okay. And yeah. He was saying, listen, we'll ship legal. We'll ship legal, but yeah. it does seem that uh, a lot of people fear that hemp under the wrong person would be regarded as being right. THC. So, so in Canada, um, Canada Post will ship um, marijuana in, in, especially the medical market, because it is legal today already. 
Um, so people, patients go online to the different licensed producer. They can go to anyone. They order off the website. It comes through Canada Post. It's no issue. Similarly, you can order wine online, right, and it gets right. delivered to your home. Um, with, with products like wine or, or, or cannabis that need to be uh, a, a, an adult, um, has to receive it right. um, and sign for it. So if there's no one home, you need to go pick it up at the post office kind of thing. Okay. But and shipping here? U.S. To the US no. no. All right. Now, no. Yeah, I would talk forever. A big Brian, because Fantastic. this is the most interesting investment concept today. Uh, I think that your analysis of that, I've got to try to get people to be a little bit less interested given the slow, what, the slower rollout, but I defer to Deb for questions. Yes, let's uh, open it up to, on the floor to questions because I know that um, you guys, after listening to all this, have some gentlemen in the back. Yeah, no, that, that's right. So, I mean, as I mentioned, Canada, even if it's an $8 billion industry, is, is only $37 million, right? So the U.S. is kind of 10 times that. Um, Europe's 20 times that. We've recently acquired a company in Poland, um, which is focused on industrial hemp. Um, they sell in 13 countries, 700 doors, and, and really we're, I mentioned we've got all these great technologies in the U.S. that we've licensed. We want to bring those technologies to there on CBD and get in there into all the drug stores, um, into um, health food stores, vitamin stores, and that's kind of what we call our Trojan horse strategy because then we'll have the sales and, and um, distribution infrastructure as medical markets come online, we'll be able to use that infrastructure to start selling THC products um, with the T God brand, and, and um, eventually, if recreational follows, um, we'll be all set up for success there as well. So it, it's kind of um, our, our entryway into Europe. Um, we've signed a letter of intent with a company in Denmark as well to begin THC cultivation. Because if you look at kind of, we've built these big facilities in Canada. Um, but I mean, when I was in the wine industry, 85% of my grapes came from third party growers, right? Um, the beer companies, spirit companies don't grow their own hops, barley. This is going to evolve there. Everyone's producing themselves now because they had to. You need the source of high quality product. But in future, over time, the sweet spot of value creation is going to be in the manufacturing, the innovation, the branding, sales and distribution. It's not going to be in the cultivation. It'll become commoditized. Maybe less so for organic, but, but overall. So yeah, we're focused very much on getting, we're a bit, I wouldn't say we're late in Canada, we're a bit later because we're not going to be selling October 1st. We'll be starting in the first quarter. Um, but not the whole market's becoming legalized in October anyway. So for me, it's about that consumer brand and getting it right. So I mean, there's so much capital coming into this industry and there's lots of different products out there. Um, we want to make sure we've got the best product um, and we're not late on organic because we're the only scale producer in organic. So we want to have that first mover advantage and lock up that, that shelf space. We've been talking to different retailers and, and um, different liquor cannabis boards across the country. They understand the organic story and they'll have an organic section will be the number one brand there. The number two brand will be Aurora, which is an offtake agreement from us. So we kind of own the number one, two. And there might be a small craft player. There won't be more than three organic players in a store. So yeah, we're, we're focused on, on really becoming that, the organic cannabis company for, for the world. I mean, the whole foods of cannabis. Um, Matt? Hi. Right. So in the US, when we were observed, when a rec market comes into an existing medical market, is it clearly disrupts the medical sector? Yep. We're seeing a deceleration in the cardholder count in Canada, similarly, that we observed in the US. Um, I think that uh, Canada Medical Association has actually recommended that they combine or just get rid of the medical market and just put it into one market. Um, what's your take on that? They, they, you, they have. Um, I mean, it'll be easier for them not to have to kind of worry about it, but. Um, I think medical will continue to exist as long as people get, I mean, it's easier to just go to direct market and buy a product. But as long as insurance companies are reimbursing people for medical, then why would you not go for a reimbursement? Um, so you, you have a couple insurance companies now, starting with Sun Life was the first, to start reimbursing. It's still quite small. And it's probably, frankly, the cannabis companies who are pushing it for it for, it, for their own employees to start with. Um, but you start somewhere. But I think as insurance companies start, I mean, these are the most risk averse people in the world, right, when it comes to insurance companies. Um, oh, if you're saying that Sun Life, if I have a health care plan with Sun Life? They'll reimburse cannabis, depending on the They employer. will? Yes. For CBD or THC? Bo both. For uh, both? For yeah. back pain, for sleep? Yes. For yes. Now, if the employer wants it, right. and all the cannabis companies obviously want it, so right. they're for their employees, they will. But it'll spread. I mean, if you think about it, um, versus all of the issues going on with opioids that they're reimbursing, which cost a lot more that have all the other issues, liabilities with it. If I was an insurance company, they're the most conservative people. They're going to be supporting it. 
um, and even versus some of the other drugs, just the, the price of it. Um, even Veterans Affairs Canada um, does reimburse, I think, about 750 per gram. Um, so I don't think the medical will go away. It won't, uh, recreational will be much bigger. Medical may remain kind of 10, 15 percent of the market. Um, but it's an important part of the market. Are, are, is your firm similar to some of your competitors also involved in clinical trials and getting more involved in true medical? Our, our, so right now um, we're still building our facilities, so we don't have the product. But our intention definitely will be to to be doing that for sure. Yeah. In the front row. Uh, can you uh, give a little more color on the spinoff you're planning? So that's going to be a U.S.-based uh, uh, acquisition company. Right. Exactly. So um, shareholders on the 28th of September who own T God shares will have the rights to be able to participate in that. Um, so basically, it's uh, for every TGOD share you own, you'll get 0.15 units. And then for every unit, it's so basically kind of seven to one, for every unit that you have, um, you can invest in that seed round for 50 cents, and you get a half warrant at $1.15. And really, because I mean, our, our retail base has been with us since the beginning, very loyal. Um, and they saw how TGOD evolved from that 50 cent round to the, to the $1.15, 165, as I mentioned before. Um, and so we want to really replicate that, focused on the U.S. market, because the U.S. is going to be a huge market. Um, we can't do business in the U.S. as a TSX listed company. We can only work, work where there's federal reg regulation. So this company will have a separate management, separate board, and be allowed to um, be uh, playing in the U.S. But and it'll list on the CSE, the Canadian Stock Exchange, which does allow to have U.S. assets. Are you going to be on the board? You know, can you say if you're going to be on the board? Or? Uh, no, I will not. Oh, yeah. I will not. Uh, back row. Yeah, so we, we are um, we're working with um, some Canadian universities in, in Quebec on, on both the agricultural science and on the food science. So on the agricultural side, around breeding, um, genetics, um, trying to get faster cycle time, how many harvests per year, um, how to get higher THC, CBD levels, um, all of those kind of things, and, and around especially around organic. And on the food science, it's more around um, dosing, microdosing, um, as we're talking about those kind of higher end products. Um, yes. And the uh, gentleman in the middle, the white shirt. Um, how do you see your distribution strategy evolving? Yeah, so in terms of medical in Canada, it's direct to patient. So we have our own e-commerce um, site. Um, we've been working with Shopify, um, a very reputable kind of business. They're working with, with many others as well. Um, and we'll have uh, kind of the, 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 the best, try we're really we're focused on making sure we've got a really great relationship direct to patient there. Um, from a uh, retail side, um, we're actually working planning on working with one of the biggest alcohol um, beverage um, distributors in Canada. We haven't announced it yet, so I can't give you specifics, um, to create a sales force focused on cannabis and will be the organic uh, company within that structure. Um, internationally, it varies. So if you look at our business in Jamaica, um, we acquired 49% of Epican. In, in Jamaica, you can't have foreign control, so we bought the most we could. This company is fully vertically integrated from um, cultivation, extraction, manufacturing, and retail. So we actually have the second um, legal uh, dispensary in, in all of Jamaica. Um, we'll have five in Kingston. We'll have five of them by the end of this year in the key tourist sites in Ocho Rios, Montego Bay, the cruise ship port, et cetera. Um, and then we're also t kind of testing things like home delivery and, and even vending machines. And, and so there we'll have retail where it makes sense and where we can do it. Um, in Canada, um, if, if you think about Ontario, for instance, I mean, you are allowing to have private retail. Um, we will have a few flagship stores to help drive our, our brand equity. Um, but I don't want to be a, a huge retailer there. I'd rather be the organic brand in 500 stores rather than having 100 stores kind of thing. I don't want to be a competitor for all the other retailers. I want to be their, their organic brand. All right, um, we're we'll going, have a few flagship stores. We're going to have to, to wrap it there, unfortunately. Well, can I just one, one last question, because I need for the... OK, I'll let Jim ask okay. the question. Um, <laughs> all right, so I want to be sure on, the, on your pe pyramid of the future consumer package goods, so you started off by talking about disruption as a way to look. Uh, the oil, pharma, pet health, edibles, beverage, global vibe, what would that, I mean, if you were Procter & Gamble, what would you say, well, you're you're not a proctor, but what is the total addressable market? Total service. Of all of those, if you just think. The total market value? Is that 500 billion? Is that a trillion market. in sales? Oh, I mean, oh globally, yeah. um, long term, it could be half a trillion dollars. Half a trillion dollars. Okay, fantastic. All thank right, you. thank you, you so much. I want to thank our guests. <laughs>